Gary. Uh, welcome to Dhaka. Thank you. We had talked about this for a long time, you know, getting you to Dhaka. Uh, you know, we have different ways of looking at the city. Uh, I mean, occasionally, I, I think mostly we describe it as the most challenging cities in the world. Uh, so I was wondering, you know, if you'd consider this time of ours, broadly speaking, as the age of cities. I mean, cities have been with us for a long time, but uh, I mean, cities have now emerged in our experience, practice, and consciousness with a different kind of vigor and intensity, uh, and obviously with its complexities. So considering that, and you have been following the transformation of cities historically and in your own practice in North America and Asia. Um, I'm just curious with this thing in our, um, in the background, how do we get to know cities? Um, and especially I was thinking of Walter Benjamin's, Benjamin's point, Walter Benjamin's point about two ways of knowing a city, uh, either in an autobiographical mode, which belongs to the native citizens, and then the documentary mode, which belongs to the visitor. And you have been here for about seven, eight days. Um, well, how did you come to know Dhaka? How did I come to know it? It's, uh, it's a, a large, complicated, city. It's, it's big for one thing. 15 million people is a large city and, uh, and it's um, a city, it seems to me, a city of districts principally, of individual districts that have qualities to them and functions to them, uh, sometimes in transition but nonetheless a series of districts and it's actually a city with rather little connective tissue between those districts. Um, most cities uh, have long histories and have a kind of uh, tissue that often is grand gestures of boulevards or other kinds of streets that connect the various districts of the city. And um, my impression is that Dhaka has few of those things. It has some grand places, have some wonderful parks, Ramna Park, others like that. Uh, it has some uh, places of real character, like the old city or, or uh, uh, Golshan or other parts of the city which have their own distinct kind of character, but rather little connection between all of these parts. And, uh, and I don't know why that's the case, uh, maybe because it would never considered itself a big city uh, until fairly recently. It was a village or a set of villages that grew up and expanded and, uh, and, and so on. But uh, it is different from most cities in that sense. So that was your first sort of, you know, uh, perception of Taka. I mean, you mentioned districts. Uh, would you consider an enclave, islands, you know, I mean, when you said that there are no connective tissues between the districts. There are some streets that are uh, filled with uh, commercial activity that connect uh, between places. There are a few places like this north-south corridor that goes to the airport that's been built as a very large artery that connects things, but not much relationship to things on either side of it. Uh, and uh, so there are things that connect. I mean, you can get from place to place in the city. But in terms of the perception of the city, uh, it's, um, they're not big enough or, or bold enough to uh, allow you to hang your understandings of each of the districts onto them. The connective tissues or the connective system or network, is this where uh, the civic spaces is supposed to happen, and that's what Dhaka perhaps lack a bit? Well, I think that's right, and it, uh, it seemed to me interesting that when you have a big uh, civic parade, you do it on the old uh, airport grounds rather than on a major street or a major boulevard going through the city. Uh, and uh, I, uh, in most cities, you would, you, you would do that in a, uh, in a public space, uh, and I think the airport is obviously belongs to the public, but it, but it's not a not a, a piece of the city that's used on an everyday basis, uh, on it. So that's sort of symbolic of the uh, of the lack of these kinds of uh, spaces in the city. Um, in your public talk a few days ago, uh, you mentioned uh, four drivers for the transformation of cities and our. 
or four ways of understanding how changes come to cities. Um, you mentioned technologies and mobility more particularly, and I, I think governance is one of uh, uh, three of the four. But also you added four new ones um, that's driving the change of cities um, in all over the world. Um, you mentioned new mobility, you mentioned uh, shared spaces, you mentioned crowdsourcing, and you mentioned eco-sustainability. It seems in all four there is also a kind of a strand that is shared by all, which is, I would say, internet infrastructure. How do you see that infrastructure arriving and changing, reshaping cities? Well, my general point that I was making was that when we plan cities, so often what we do is try to remedy the problems that we have today. And if you said, what are the problems of uh, Dhaka? Uh, you know, you'd say congestion is one of the great problems, the flooding during the rainy season is one of the great problems, the, the presence of um, many slum areas that don't have adequate services, etc. And, and you go about the process of remedying those kinds of, uh, those kinds of uh, issues. But when you make investments in a city, you make investments that are going to last 20 or 40 years. And so if you say, uh, if we can solve today's congestion in the city, will we have a better city 20 years from now? You can't guarantee that because, in fact, the conditions of mobility are going to change. Uh, the kind of vehicles we have on the roads are going to be different. The um, ownership of vehicles is going to shift over that period of time. And so I think there's another way of thinking about the planning and, and development of cities, which is to look out 20 years into the future and say, okay, what are the new conditions that are going to drive this city in a new direction over that period of time, whether we plan for it or not? And it would be better if we did plan for it because then we can capitalize on the opportunities they present. And so uh, I talked about four uh, basic uh, uh, drivers of change that I think are really important. One is, uh, is the new technologies of, of, of mobility. Uh, second is the crowdsourcing of finance and, and uh, crowdsourcing of, uh, of planning as, a, as an activity. Uh, where many more people have the capacity to actually participate in, in both of those kinds of things. Um, I talked about the, um, the uh, issue of uh, uh, the new echo sensibility that is going to be essential for cities because uh, with climate change it's, uh, it's uh, clear that uh, even if we were to plan for the things like the, uh, uh, where the rainwater goes during the rainy season here with climate change we're going to have a lot more rainfall and we're going to have a lot more droughts and we're going to have a lot more uh, 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 kinds of, kinds of uh, problems in the city. And so all of these things you're anticipating uh, a future and um, I, uh, I think that's, um, it's, it's, it's really critically important that you, uh, you think into the future. So how is it going to happen? All of these things, I think, are going to require new kinds of uh, uh, infrastructure, and the new infrastructure is internet infrastructure. Uh, it's amazing to me to see the fact that most of the communications infrastructure of the city hangs on poles now and is interconnected. It seems keep them exposed. Yeah, it's amazing to me that uh, how you would actually figure out which one of those lines goes to your place if something went wrong with it at the moment. So you have a job of just, you know, taking care of the today's infrastructure on there. But fortunately, inter internet in infrastructure can go wireless, and I think that's, that's, that's the future. And so with a series of wireless points throughout the city, provided publicly, I believe, uh, you actually have the capacity of every business and every individual to become part of a uh, communications infrastructure. And to make many, many of those wires that are, uh, 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 you know, on the streets now are going to become obsolete as a result of that. Uh, You're right, you know, uh, already, uh, you know, a big population of the country has shifted from the regular landline telephones to cell phones, you know, and in, in many cases they've been, become defunct, you know, people don't have 
uh, landlines in their homes anymore. I, you right. know, so cable cable television will shift to satellite uh, based television, and so many of these these systems that we have today are not going to be. Uh, and I think some the of the some of the students who are asking you questions at the at the talk, uh, this. I, I'm imagining they thought that some of the future scenarios seem very foreign, but I think you pointed out, and maybe you want to talk about that, they're already in it. In yes, one of the four that I talked about was the, uh, the uh, new accommodations of living and working uh, in an interconnected way, uh, uh, which, which is a whole new, uh, a new uh, part of urban life. And, and so this means that uh, you can order on the internet your groceries to be brought to your house if you wish. You can order on the, you can communicate with your friends uh, vicariously every minute of the day. You can, uh, you can conduct business on the internet. I, I pointed out that in uh, many cities, uh, what's emerging is places, hotspots where people actually do their business. So. In, uh, in, in, in many cities, people go to a public library which has good internet service and they actually run their business there. Uh, and uh, if they need to meet somebody, they uh, find a place, a coffee shop or another kind of place where they can, uh, where they can uh, get together with those people. And so you get a whole new network of places in the city that have become the new points of connection, the new, the new nexus of the, of the new emerging economy in a city. On this particular point about this sort of new nexus of uh, even work-live situations, small-scale uh, but connected, um, which seems to be a post-zoning kind of situation. Um, and you also made an observation in some inherent ways that you observe that in old Dhaka. You know, that's already kind of, in a, in a, in a pre-internet way, that's already happening. I would like to come to that, but before that, of the four points, it seems to me the first three, new mobility, shared spaces and crowdsourcing, share quite a lot, you know, and basically based on the internet technology. But the fourth one, the eco-sustainability or sensibility, seems to stand on its own a little bit. And I was wondering if you can actually call it a driver yet. It's not quite a driver, but an ethical you know, imperative, you know, which we need to work with. Uh, and therefore, uh, the question of whether eco-sustainability or eco-sensibility still is in a kind of opposition to the economic engine that drives the city. Uh, you know, how do you see the two? Well, I think that if you actually cost uh, the um, damages that are produced by not dealing with uh, ecological issues in development or in the building of the city, uh, it actually is an incredible drag on a city's economy. Uh, we had an experience in New York City uh, of uh, having uh, a hurricane uh, push uh, a wall of, uh, of uh, two and a half meters of, um, of, uh, of water uh, into lower Manhattan and it flooded a third of lower Manhattan. It closed the city down for two weeks. The cost of that is astounding. Not just the cost, the direct cost of, of repairing it, but the cost to businesses and to others of, of this. And so to the extent that we, we actually cost out the um, uh, impacts of not dealing with ecological issues, um, we're neglecting an important piece of our economy of cities. And cities are, in the end, economic engines. They're places of making things, of communicating, of, uh, of uh, uh, doing um, uh, goods and services and shopping and, and all of these other kinds of things. We close the city down for two weeks. That's a huge cost. That's when Sandy happened. That's when Sandy happened. Right. I mean, it's, but you do it every year. That's here. right. No, no. I was thinking <laughs> that, you know, uh, from Katrina to Sandy and we do it every year, uh, it seems we need such uh, disasters or catastrophes to remind us of the ecological um, system that we are in and that you have to work with. Um, so, uh, I mean, we don't have to wait for a disaster to get this, you know, uh, in our uh, consciousness and policies and way of thinking and doing. 
So is there a role here for urban designers and architects? Well, I, a, lot of, uh, a lot of the issues are ones which designers and urban designers in particular, people who design parts of cities. And I use the term urban designer rather broadly. That is, it's not just architects who are working at a scale larger than individual buildings, but it's uh, engineers who are putting infrastructure into the city. It's, uh, it's uh, city planners who are making decisions on major infrastructure uh, systems, uh, transportation people, et cetera. So that's my universe of, urban, of people that are really designing cities on this. And so there are a huge number of roles on this. Um, as I've looked around DACA, I've actually seen some really interesting things here. Uh, one is that in your new residential developments, uh, what you've been doing is uh, building a lot of housing. Some of it is very mixed quality. I mean, some of it is quite good. Some of it's very good, actually. I was saying this morning, I was looking at some housing, and I said, you know, we don't have anything in new development in New York that compares to this. This is, a, a, you know, a higher quality than that. A lot of it mediocre, a lot of it inexpensive, and, and, and the rest. But the one, and, and so what it's allowed you to do is actually build communities very quickly because you have many small developers building things. But what isn't being taken care of is the common infrastructure, the common lands, the uh, ecological issues. And so each time uh, an area is filled with, uh, with sand and uh, subdivided and small developers arrive on the scene, that water has to go somewhere. And, uh, and it goes to the wetland areas that remain around the city. It drains in through the city. It goes into the rivers, which go burst over their shores and other kinds of things. So each time you make a decision as an urban designer that you're not going to attend to this problem, what you've done is shifted that problem to the public, to everybody else in the society. And uh, it's not just a moral issue, it's in fact an issue uh, that the society can't afford to have everybody shifting all its problems to the public uh, for future uh, 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 action. I mean, you mentioned community, and maybe I want to kind of jump to that right uh, at this point. Um, earlier you mentioned that Dhaka, as you saw it, is uh, you know, a number of districts, you know, and I was saying that it's a really enclaves, islands unto themselves. And within that, there are parcels of land on which people have built these individual properties developed by developers. And so there are islands also, many islands. Whether they form communities, uh, not quite sure. Um, you know, uh, and we had been talking about this you know, and in various sort of uh, occasions that Dhaka, the historic Dhaka has begun to lose its sense of communities. And maybe the only place where we still find uh, community that's active is in the old part of the city and what you mentioned already or earlier is that because it's formed of uh, mixed use practices uh, live and work small scale tissues um, walkable so all those characteristics that perhaps defines what a community uh, may mean but also at the same time, even old Dhaka is facing uh, major challenges and it's going to be shifting to other potentials. And based on what you saw in old Dhaka, this walkable, small scale, live and work communities, and then what you mentioned earlier about sort of uh, the internet based communities, you know, can we think of a, um, a neighborhood model? that's already been established here and th that then can be transformed in one way for thinking about urban design for larger, newer, newer brand of development, which is where communities are lacking. Well, I think that you're, what you said is exactly right, which is that in old parts of, uh, in the old parts of Dhaka, in fact, there is a kind of community that has to do with the fact that people are economically connected to each other. If you go to old Dhaka and you find, you know, in one block uh, uh, all the people who are selling auto parts and the next block all the people are doing hardware and the next block all the people who are selling fabrics and, and, and all of these. There are whole communities of people that are economically engaged with each other and they're rubbing shoulders with each other and finding opportunities to work together on things. And 
and many of them live on the upper stories of the buildings uh, above uh, there. Many of them go to schools that are uh, directly uh, uh, within the neighborhood or on the fringe of the neighborhood. So there are all of these kinds of uh, qualities in it. And the streets themselves are where people come in contact with each other. And uh, the streets are narrow enough so that you don't have big vehicles uh, going down those streets. You have many, many uh, rickshaws. You have many people pulling carts with materials on them and all the rest. But many people know the other people who are on those streets on it. Uh, uh, that's not so much the case in, uh, in the newer districts of the city. Uh, uh, in part, I think, because there is a single-use zoning in place, which means that you can't do businesses uh, uh, easily in, uh, in, in, in that area. Um, maybe you can do business in your apartment up above, and some people I'm told are complaining about how many people are running businesses in apartments in some of the nice districts of the city. Uh, but you know, I don't know what the number is here in DACA. In New York, in, in, in the United States, 28% of people who work, work for themselves. And I bet that number is very high here in DACA. That uh, fairly, if you don't work for the government and if you uh, uh, don't work for some of the large corporations, you're doing business for yourself. And therefore, you have to have ways of coming in contact with other people, making connections, doing business, uh, and, uh, and become part of a network within the, within the city. And that's going to be future, in the future for services because as cities grow and become more prosperous, what happens is that the percentage of the city that's in manufacturing goes down and the percentage in services goes up. And so uh, you have a very different, uh, different kind of economy in a, in a, um, a more developed city uh, here. I was, uh, I was reminded when you're, you're saying where do people come in contact with each other. Uh, I once asked my students, uh, if you had to choose just one measure of what, what makes a city, what would it be? And one student at the back of the class put his hand up and he said, whether you have sidewalks. And he meant it in a you know American way, which is that if it, if the settlement is not so dense and people don't walk anywhere, you don't need sidewalks and the rest. So the density uh, that's high enough for people to want to walk from place to place. But here it has a different kind of cut because you actually don't have sidewalks here in most of this city, and so you can't really walk to a corner store or meet a person on the corner or, or other things like that. Well, that's been my biggest complaint for a long time and you know when I'd been writing in the newspapers here I think one time I wrote an article saying that uh, Dhaka does not believe in sidewalks in an ironic way. Um, it kind of was a take on a old Russian film, Moscow does not believe in tears. Yes. So I said, Dhaka does not believe in sidewalk. You know, I, yeah. but you know, to me, and, I, and I, then I went on to write that sidewalks are what marks the civility of a city, you know, because I can walk, you know. I mean, this is my, uh, my you know, ingrained rights, if you like, as a human being, and I'm refused that, you know. Yes. And then, you know, that's civility to me. And if the city is about civility, and then, you know, if there are no sidewalks, then, well, there's not a city then, you know. I mean, there are congregation of buildings, assemblages of this and that, but it's not a civil space. Not a civil you know, space. it also has a really important social function. Uh, um, Richard Summer, many years ago, uh, uh, wrote an uh, uh, article and then a part of a book on the fact that um, being in public and in contact with people who are different from yourself is actually critically important in this era because most of the information we have about others in the city comes vicariously. We see a television program and we think all of those people are like that. Uh, or we see the news and we see something happening and we stereotype the people who are involved in that. And being in public, walking on a sidewalk, coming in contact with people, uh, poor people, wealthy people, others, is your way of actually understanding the city that you're part of. You know, one interesting thing that has happened, so yes, uh, Dhaka lacks sidewalk, very fundamental, not for the civic engagement or the sort of vicarious sort of, you know, uh, appreciation of the city, 
But it also links to uh, what eventually will come up in Dhaka, the mass transit rail system and all that. You know, you can't have stations and no way to get there. You can't be driving to them. You can't, you know, and you know, it creates a whole lot of other issues. So I think it's quite linked with the, um, the kind of the, uh, the priority of sidewalks and walking. But you mentioned uh, this uh, civic uh, experience or engagement or encounters, which brings me to its, this very old uh, document or documentary by William White yes. recording uh, life in civic spaces. And perhaps I was wondering, uh, again, returning to internet uh, technology infrastructure and new practices. Uh, how do you see, as you have seen various cities, North America, Asia, Europe, uh, the nature of civic uh, experience and encounters being transformed by internet culture? Yeah. Uh, I just want to add something here, um, coffee shops. You know, it seems like coffee shops have become uh, kind of alternate civic spaces, plazas, you know, which in Dhaka, the middle class, uh, or the upper middle class and the middle class, they have receded into the interiors of coffee shops. You know, they're not out on the streets walking. Either they're driving or they're in their coffee shops. You know, that's at best they can encounter uh, what you're mentioning a little earlier. Well, you have a whole new uh, civic public realm in cities, and uh, some of it is in commercial spaces like coffee shops, some of it uh, uh, in shopping centers and in other kind, uh, kinds of places like that. So these are, these guys ought to be seen as a part of the civic, not the civic part of the city, but of the public part of the city. The, and uh, and uh, when you're planning a city, you, you know, want to make sure that you can get to these places. You want to be sure that if you meet somebody in a coffee shop, you can stand on a sidewalk or outside there and have a conversation with them. Um, more, many, many cities around the world are making sure they have internet in parks because people go to parks uh, actually uh, and connect with other people there. And uh, so you see, uh, it's always amusing to me to see a whole group of people all sitting in the park, all That's looking right. at their, uh, at their uh, iPhones, and, uh, and yet they feel in touch with those people and uh, in contact. Uh, so it's a kind of hybrid world of, uh, of vicarious and, and, and direct presence uh, in the city. Well, in the late 80s, when I was just getting out of MIT, you know, I mean, there was this um, pronouncement or premonition that uh, internet will be the death of cities. Uh, but that hasn't happened. It's been the, just the o exact opposite of that because what it does is actually makes people want to be among others who are part of their uh, interest groups and their, and it allows them to connect with them and, and bring them together. You know, the internet is also an incredible force for bringing people together. Uh, if you want to hold a public meeting uh, now, uh, you can get the word out to people. They, they, they appear. Uh, I mean, some of it's, it's negative. Uh, 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 you know, we have uh, uh, flash mobs in the United States where people uh, communicate with a big bunch you know, and all of a sudden they all show up in one location. Uh, uh, and I would guess that the kind of demonstrations that were going on in this city here were, uh, had everything to do with being able to communicate uh, through social, the, media, uh, social media, that's right on it. So it, it, it is changing the nature and dynamic of, uh, of uh, uh, large public gatherings and public life in the city. I don't know if you know that book, Can Android Crows Fly Over Tokyo? I don't know it, right. but tell me. Yeah. Right. So, uh, well, basically tracking uh, a new way of uh, social uh, encounters and engagements in Tokyo, but because of the, you know, either cell phone or, or internet. And the author uh, was talking about, you know, um, young girls actually, you know, um, in most cases live a very restricted life monitored, surveilled at home, but they use cell phones and internet to make connections and they would go to certain locations in the city like Harajuku yes. and they would just like dress up in a certain way and just walk around, you know, yeah. the, like the Gangnam Street. Right. And these girls, have, they have established a norm in Tokyo, the Harajuku girls, yes. so, uh, yes. but based on the sort of new possibility of like alternate way of connecting and being a part of the city. That's right. right. That's right. Um, now going back to uh, 
you know, back to mobility and, uh, and we know that you have been very interested in transportation, uh, planning if I may say it, or transportation design as far as the organization of cities are involved. And uh, we are all very uh, clear that how transportation is key in arranging and rearranging parts of the city. Um, including, you know, land development patterns, you know, it can actually dictate, um, predict and reorganize. Uh, but we also know that in Dhaka, transportation is the curse of the city. And uh, yeah, this is maybe premature, but if, if I were to ask you, you know, if you had five recommendations for transportation reshuffling for Dhaka, what would they be? Well, these are not uh, in order of priority because I think actually the city has to do several things concurrently. It's not uh, a case that you could, there's no silver bullet as we say. There's no one single thing that will solve uh, all of the transportation issues and plan for the future of transportation in the city. There are many things that have to get done. But let me give you a sense, if you ask for five, here's what I would say. First. Um, uh, there is a need for traffic management on the streets. Uh, as I've looked around this, gone around the city and looked at it, actually you have quite a lot of road space in this city. A lot of wide roads. A lot of wide roads that are functioning as one lane roadways, basically. Because what's happened is that uh, the sides of the roadway have, have uh, buses uh, parked on them that came in, brought people in in the morning, and they sit there all day, and then they take people back at night. They have uh, 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 large oil trucks that park on the side of the roadway. They have, uh, uh, many cases, uh, markets and hawkers that, that find their way and grab a lane or two of the roadway. Then there are the, uh, the um, rickshaws that are all parked or, or circulating on, on the roadway that take up a, a lot of space. They serve an important function, but, but they're taking a lot of space. And when it's all set, it's, and then when a, another bus comes in, it parks in the outside of all those people to let people off. And, and so when you actually look at these road UAs, you have one way, one lane in each direction on them. And so roadway management is going to be, you know, a really critical issue. Now, not easy. I mean, where do you park those buses for the day? Where do you park the oil trucks? Where do you, uh, 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 can you create zones in which buses can pull over and out of the traffic and let people off, et cetera? But that's clearly a remedial thing, and that's probably you know, one of the first things that should occur because that would have the most immediate direct benefit. Ah, pedestrians have to be part of that mix. I mean, at the moment, it is virtually impossible to cross m many of your roadways. Even in places where there are large pedestrian flows, people have to go up a very large curb into the median and wait for the traffic and then go on the other side. So in that sorting out of the uh, use of existing roadways, uh, pedestrians have to be a part of it. and. Uh, and um, so, that, so that's one. Uh, second issue is that you, you do have to uh, uh, develop some better, uh, better I mean higher capacity and also uh, faster um, uh, long haul alternatives in the city. The trains are overcrowded. Uh, they go at uh, only certain hours of the day. Uh, the buses uh, go only as fast as the uh, as the traffic allows them, as the congestion allows them to go uh, in the city. Uh, having private buses is actually in its own uh, not a, not a bad idea because it gives service to areas of the city where you probably couldn't get uh, public buses to go on it. Uh, but what you don't have is 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 real long haul capabilities, and and either you have to do a mass transit system uh, a. Uh, subway system or a uh, or a uh, elevated uh, system uh, in some ways doing an elevated system is a lot easier and a lot cheaper than doing a, a, a subway system in this city uh, but um, either you have to get going on that quickly or you have to create a, a, a express bus system uh, uh, um, and uh, bus rapid transit is being done in uh, in uh, cities all over the world it's very effective that's a uh, 
It's a um, solution that you can put in place often with existing roadways. I mean, if you think of it now, what you have basically with all those uh, buses stopping on the outer sides of the roadways, two lanes devoted to buses, if you put those in the middle of the roadway instead of at the edges of it and created overpasses to get people over to their destinations on this stuff, in many of the, the corridors that you have, which are relatively uh, 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 free-flowing corridors at, uh, uh, on the weekends, uh, you could actually uh, ins install uh, bus rapid transit. And, and so that decision has to get made and, and there's, it has to be made soon because uh, there are all kinds of linkages between the lack of uh, long haul uh, transit and, uh, and, their, and the number of buses on the road and, um, and, and so on. So that's a second uh, alternative. Third alternative is that um, I am, my impression, and I, I would have to uh, you know, know more about the city to know whether it's accurate or not, is that the, uh, the city's pattern contributes to uh, the, the mobility problems that are here. Uh, in cities where you have a lot of congestion, what happens is that every person building a new office building moves that office building to a place where uh, it's less congested. And so instead of uh, uh, offices being built in the CBD, they're moving up to Golshan because you know, Golshan Road actually has reasonably good capacity. You can get there. It also happens to be near the managers of the businesses where they live and, and the rest of it. But that keeps happening. People keep moving in it. And, and the effect of that uh, is that it becomes almost impossible to build a transit system to serve them because the, the concentrations are spread all over the city. There are clusters of things here, there, everywhere in no rational way. And so part of the uh, solution to the problem of mobility is a solution of land use of clustering in places where you can put transit service in place. One, two, and three are linked. They're linked, yes. And uh, so in, in Bangkok, for example, uh, when we did the Metropolitan Plan for Bangkok, uh, we said uh, you should uh, cluster all of your high density development in places that are mass transit friendly, where they will have mass transit in the future. And they've been doing that, and it's actually had a significant impact uh, uh, on the uh, pattern of the city. Uh, at uh, Makassan Station, which was uh, really underused land uh, um, around one of its uh, two main stations, uh, um, they have cr created two transit lines that go into that, and they, one of those transit lines is the transit service to the new airport. And uh, they have also created a very large parking structure there, which people can get off an expressway directly into the parking structure on it. And now office buildings are being built around there and commercial complexes and other things. So that many, many of the people arriving at that aren't coming by, by automobile or they're shifting from automobile to transit in that location. And so, and the same is true in, in outlying areas. Um, uh, you have a directional traffic flow in the city in the morning, everybody's coming into the city. In the afternoon, they're going out. If you took some of the main uh, uh, government offices, for example, and put them at the edge of the city, in transit loca locations on it, uh, then you could balance the use of the roadways and the use of transit systems in it. So I would say that's a third piece. A fourth piece is, the, um, is what we talked about earlier, which is that when you build transit and you have you know, really efficient transit service, and you have a few locations where that transit is served, then you have the last mile problem, which is how do you get from that transit to, uh, to your destination if it isn't right there, your home, uh, shopping center, other kinds of things. Today you use uh, rickshaws, which are actually a pretty remarkable uh, form of transportation, uh, but um, actually uh, you, can't, you often can't get a rickshaw at your home, uh, and so there will need to be ways to walk. There will need to be uh, mini bus service and other. That's where the private services can really serve a role of picking people up at transit stations and dropping them off somewhere in the neighborhood that's, that's, uh, that's adjacent to it. That's incidentally also a place where uh, on-demand um, uh, services will come into play. Uh, uh, so in Helsinki, for example, now you can uh, you can go on your iPhone and uh, you can call for a, a bus 
and it'll pick you up within one block of your home and take you to somewhere within one block of where you're headed and uh, these are mini buses that are used and, and are operated uh, in, in this way. And then I guess finally uh, uh, you do have to solve the problem of, um, of uh, industrial traffic. Uh, at the moment uh, you have the most astounding array of trucks uh, in the city but also in the industrial areas to the east of the city uh, on it. Those trucks often have no place to park. They're also being left on sides of roadways. Uh, those trucks are, I'm sure, duplicating what others are doing. There are also many of them because they can't put big trucks on those roads. The roads are in inadequate for it. And so building some roadway capacity is going to be needed. Uh, uh, and you're going to have to encourage people to actually consolidate their their use of uh, of those those uh, kinds of vehicles. And so if those would be my five uh, five pieces. The one thing I would not do, and this may be a little controversial, is I'd not build more expressways in the middle of the city, because that just encourages people to drive into the city and 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 makes the problem worse. And having seen the kind of the recent development or history of cities in North America or Europe, you know, they have stopped doing that a long time ago. I mean, they're taking them down. Um, what they can do, though, with ones that are there today is begin to use some of the lanes for express bus service. So in, um, in um, China, in Chengdu, for example, they built a ring road around the center of the city, actually not right in the center, but out about three or four kilometers from the center of the city and they put um, bus rapid transit on that which comes down to the ground and goes to locations where people can then transfer to uh, taxis or, or uh, many services of one kind or another to get to their home. I mean, yeah, I know, uh, in my mind elevated roadways um, again are dedicated for cars, individual vehicles you know and they are um, operated by a very limited number of people, you know, the vast number of the population relying on mass tr or public transport and all that are, um, have to do all kinds of things. To yeah, that's right. Go that's by, right. go along. But if I can uh, list them again quickly, uh, Gary, and thank you for doing this, you know, um, or, you know, I've encouraged you to do this. I mean, there are a number of items here, the five points, you know, they're from remedial, small to big, remedial to structural, small to big, um, the number one was management of roadways or road culture, you know, and that has a number of items there. Uh, number two is, you know, sorting out, the, uh, number two is um, in to introduce higher capacity and faster movement system. And that goes a range, through a range of things, MRT, uh, ra you know, rapid bus system. You have an also mentioned uh, water-based transportation. I mean, in Taka, as in Bangkok, you, where you have worked, uh, you know, I think uh, you know there's a big contribution that can be made through water-based transportation, uh, and then there are linkages. You know, it's not just you know one system operating on their own. And the third is you know patterns of the city, land use, so to speak, concentration, density, aggregation that are then connected to the transportation system. Uh, fourth is, you know, the location of the stations and how do I get there or from the station, how do I go to my final destination. You know, the network of movement, which I believe primarily is either pedestrian or based on other kind of, you know, smaller vehicles in Taka, it could be the rickshaw. And which goes back to the necessity of sidewalk as a kind of, you know, a very sort of serious system, you know, which we haven't given any attention to. And lastly, you know, what do we do with the industrial traffic, you know, which is really disruptive to the, to the city, to the movement, although there are some regulations when they can ply on which time of the day and all that, but, you know, it is eventually quite disruptive. So uh, we'd like to think about this a bit more, the five points, and see how it uh, can... Um, you know. It's clearly an important issue here. I mean, I, you know, if you ask people what's, what needs to get done, the first thing they always say is congestion. It's, sure. it's a, on it, and, and it's also an economic issue. I mean, the number of hours wasted in congestion, uh, not only by people, individuals, but by truckers and by uh, uh, people who are doing business of one kind or another, it's a huge drag on the economy. Absolutely, and uh, I mean, you know, it's, uh, I 
it's okay to mention this, you know, the recent uh, student um, protest you have seen. And I mean, they knew very well, you know, where to um, interfere. A few choke, a, a few choke points That's can right. actually close down the city. Close down, you know, put pressure on the larger community and the state and the city. I mean, they knew very well what to do. Yeah, you know, very and, little uh, redundancy in the system right. here. Okay. Well, uh, Gary, finally, uh, um, I mean, you have worked in Bangkok with, you know, with a team of, you know, very extraordinary um, planners and engineers, you know, all from M MIT, I believe, you know, you're involved in the planning of Bangkok in the late 80s and 90s, which the city of Bangkok is, you know, seeing the fruits of right now. And we see that, you know, the city has transformed from where it was 20 years ago. Uh, 20 years ago, it looked like what Dhaka is now, which is kind of uncanny, I would say. And yeah, when I came here, I, I, I uh, <clears throat> said to myself, I've seen this movie before. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and you want to play a role in that movie again? <laughs> um, which, in an interesting way, you know, it's a good thing to think about, you know, because, you know, living in the city, we all seem to think, I mean, this is it, you know, uh, we just have to kind of live by Dhaka as it is. But uh, with your uh, discussing with you, you arriving in Dhaka made many of us realize, you know, things can be changed. I mean, it's not easy, it's complex, complicated, but still we can bring about a change to a city which seems to be, you know, this is, you know, the direst condition and we have to just live through it. So my uh, final uh, question is, you know, how do we go about, you know, um, bringing a major transformation to a city? You know, one um, conventional mode is what is established, do a master plan, you know, master planning. And we know that master planning, and I am using a verb here, uh, has limitations. You know, first of all, it's top down, and then there's always a lag between the planning and implementation, and um, and it's mostly about providing regulatory um, policies which don't quite get carried out at the ground level. Although we know that there is a need to do a comprehensive plan, you know, whether you want to call it a master plan or some kind of guideline. But what alternatives are there other to, other to master plan? Because, you know, you have applied other methods of planning in Bangkok. Well, when we worked on the... Uh Bangkok um, plan, uh, we were actually asked to do a comprehensive, detailed master plan for the city, because that's what they had done in the, in the past. And so I looked at the previous master plan. They're actually uh, obliged every 10 years to uh, produce a new master plan and to update it every five years uh, along, along the way. And what seemed clear to me is that the things that they had proposed 10 years before still remained issues in the city. They really hadn't had the capacity to uh, carry out a lot of the things. There was a new motion uh, of uh, people using the private sector to build expressways and transit systems and other, other such things which, was, which ultimately bore fruit, but, uh, but it was just beginning at the time when we were working on this. And, and I decided, I looked at it and I decided that actually the city did not have the capacity to give full attention to development all over the metropolitan area. Didn't have the staff, didn't have the <clears throat> regulatory capacity, didn't have the ability to enforce things, uh, and so on. And so, and they would never get that, the staff and the, and the uh, capacity to do that. So, we decided what we really needed was a strategic plan for the city. Uh, that is to find areas where they should put their time and attention into and make sure they were done right. Uh, because those areas would in the end uh, determine in some large way the quality of life in the city. And to just deal with the other areas of the city through some simple regulations, FAR, height limitations, and let them develop, you know, as they as they developed on on this, and forget the issue of doing close scrutiny of those things because you should put your attention into these areas. And so we actually singled out five locations in the inner city where they had real development opportunities that had to do with.
tapping the potentials of mass transit. I mentioned one of them at Makassan Station. Actually, three of them were at stations uh, because they already had large numbers of people coming into uh, those areas by bus and by, uh, by train. And the two other ones were other large opportunity areas. There were large sites that were capable, mostly in government control, that were capable of uh, focusing the development and they were sites that were mass transit would go through and, uh, and, and, and the rest of it. Then we also selected five locations on the perimeter of the city where we felt that uh, they should channel um, uh, public investment they should make sure that the infrastructure was in place before development occurred in those areas and they should plan them and they should put their regulatory hats on and make sure that stuff was done well in those places and they were spots and the area around them would spread with development less regulated but once you set the examples in these places in fact maybe they would provide competition that would force others to do better in the in the areas that were that were surrounding it. So those ten areas were the were the basis of the strategic plan. <clears throat> ten locations and then a number of systems, mass transit systems uh, going uh, to and from places, uh, clongs, canals that needed to be worked on, widened and protected because they were causing uh, problems. Uh, some large regulations that, that were not specifically land use regulations but were, were critical to land use. For example, one of the things that had happened in, in Bangkok is that they were as you are displacing all of the wetlands in the perimeter of the city. And so uh, they didn't have the capacity to store rainwater. It then had to drain through the city to the rivers and all of those clongs were flooding and, and that was the fundamental problem. But there's another problem which is that it, as development occurred out in the perimeter of the city, they, um, they had no water supply there and they had no, uh, uh, no sewage disposal in those areas. So having no water supply meant that for industry and also for uh, uh, residential development they had to drill wells, draw water out of the groundwater supply and the lands were actually subsiding in those areas. They, in fact, in, were subsiding up to 10 centimeters a year, up to four inches a year uh, in those areas. And, you know, after 10 years, that land has gone down a meter and the water no longer drains towards the, uh, to, the, uh, to the rivers. The water now drains from the rivers to, the, to those areas. And so they had to solve that problem and prohibit uh, use of wells for industrial uses and get the water supply out into those areas that they needed. So there were a number of infrastructure decisions that had to get made for suburban areas uh, uh, in order to solve the flooding problems uh, in the city. So those are the kind of things that we focused on. They were critical public systems, they were transportation networks, and they were a limited number of places where they really had to put their time and energy into planning, getting infrastructure in the ground, uh, and, um, and regulating development on them. You ha I mean, you have some advantages here that they didn't have. They didn't have a capital development authority. Whether they've done well or poorly, you know, I, I have no idea on it up to now, but you actually have some entities in place that could take on these, these specific developments and, uh, and uh, carry out the kind of things that are needed, have both regulatory power and also, uh, also development powers. And uh, so you're starting ahead of where Bangkok was. Well, uh, does this sound like a, a note of optimism? Yes, absolutely. I, I think this city could be very different uh, uh, 10 or 15 years from now. Uh, if you, for example, in the uh, perimeter areas managed to create uh, areas that were reserved for impounding the, the uh, rainwater, that were also recreation areas, which some of the recreation areas would flood during the rainy season, but the rest of the year it was available for them. You could have magnificent parks out there that, that were attractive and became the kind of centerpiece of uh, communities. Uh, you could have streets here, starting by a few uh, demonstration projects where 
Uh, people are out using the streets, walking on the streets, cars are restricted from them. Uh, all of these things uh, are probably not luxuries, but they're also necessities uh, to be the city that's going to attract international capital and international investments and, and become the kind of leader in, its, in your region. Well, uh, thank you, Gary. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, one thing, I, the way I see design, you know, design cannot be cynical. And someone who's involved in urban design, you know, will have to think, you know, uh, alternative ways of moving on to the next best thing. And will have to be inventive, you know, in whatever condition that he or she is working uh, in. So, Gary, thank you very much. And perhaps we'll see you again in this city uh, very soon. Thank you. Yes.